Hello, my name is Eric Jarvis. I am a uh, associate professor at Duke University Medical Center and also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. And I am a uh, scientist who studies uh, complex uh, traits generated by the brain. And I'm interested in general brain function and how the brain controls uh, complex behaviors. And the behavior that I'm most interested in we call vocal learning. Uh, or, and I'm going to talk to you about the brain pathways for vocal learning. Now you've got to understand what is vocal learning? Not everybody has heard about this uh, trait, uh, but uh, it is something that you do every day. You use it to actually uh, produce language or spoken language. So let me explain what that's about. First we're going to talk about that the behavior itself, its convergence, and the brain pathway. So <clears throat> vocal learning is a very rare trait. And we're going to call it production type of vocal learning, like a motor behavior, that is to move something, but in this case, to move the uh, larynx. Five groups of mammals are known to have this, us humans. And in us humans, that gives us the ability to imitate speech, what I'm doing now. Dolphins and whales also have it, uh, bats. And recently, it was shown elephants. elephants uh, imitating truck sounds along the road in a, in a zoo in Asia. And I recently heard about an elephant who puts his trunk in his mouth and moves up and down his lips, producing some words in Korean that a Korean person will know, like move back, move forward. But um, <coughs> uh, I couldn't understand uh, because I don't speak Korean. Uh, and then uh, also in seals. And then three groups of birds, parrots, hummingbirds, and songbirds. And the word par parrot has even become synonymous with vocal mimicry, like uh, Polly won a cracker and so forth. Uh, hummingbirds, many people don't realize, but they have these songs that are learned. They're very high in pitch, uh, and they uh, transmit that information culturally from one generation to the next, like these other vocal learners do, and then finally songbirds. So what is it about that, of this trait that's different from other abilities? Well, vocal learning depends on a another type of learning called uh, auditory learning. But it's different from auditory learning, and everybody that has ears basically has auditory learning. So what is it? And a good example is dogs can understand the word sit, or learn to understand the word sit, or siente se in Spanish, usuari in Japanese. They all mean the same thing, which is to sit. Dogs can even understand some rudimentary syntax, like come here, boy, fetch the newspaper. But dogs have a very difficult time saying siente se, o suwari, or sit, or come here, boy. But vocal learners can hear this information and then repeat it back to you, uh, and mostly of their own species vocalizations, but some can do it of others, uh, other species like us. And <clears throat> But I don't want to give you the sense that once you have vocal learning, all these species can have spoken language. That's not the case. But they do have the ability to at least to imitate some rudimentary sounds, and some more complex than others. So what about the genetic relationships of these vocal learners? Well, shown here, I have a family tree of birds and a family tree of mammals. And I have the vocal learners highlighted in red. For instance, here, the hummingbirds the uh, parrots down there, and the songbirds way down there. Likewise, amongst the mammals here in this uh, tree. And what we can see is that the vocal learners are dispersed unevenly throughout this family tree amongst many other species, like lions, tigers, and bears, that don't have this ability. And <clears throat> uh, so it's been argued that, let's say, hummingbirds, parrots, and songbirds have each evolved this trait independently of a common ancestor. So these black dots here denote uh, what we would consider independent gains of vocal learning. It's also possible that uh, back here, at uh, some point where there was a common ancestor between uh, parrots and songbirds that might have had vocal learning, and then the sub songbirds lost the trait. Uh, that would be like humans down here in this family tree and chimpanzees having a common ancestor that was a vocal learner and then uh, chimpanzees losing speech but humans maintaining it. So, <clears throat> so one of the questions that we've been asking is if the behavior is similar across these species and apparently uh, convergent, that is 
they came about this solution independent of a common ancestor. Well, what about the brain pathways? Um, <clears throat> but before I talk about that, I do want to show you uh, something more about the behavior that shows that vocal learners don't just simply imitate. If we can play this video. Alice, look for the track. How many total? One. So, what you just heard was uh, Irene Pepperberg uh, and her uh, uh, study animal here, Alex, um, was uh, communicating with each other. And Alex had imitated the sound one uh, before he actually uh, communicated with her. But I show you this video for several reasons. It's not just that simply Alex uh, here, this African gray parrot, is imitating, but uh, he's imitating human speech sounds. And he's communicating, this is interspecies communicating with another uh, uh, species, in this case a human. And Irene is asking Alex a question and Alex is answering that question back to her. Uh, <clears throat> not only that, is she asks how many. And the reason why I show this video, it seems simple because he says one, but um, Alex is actually counting. He adds one plus zero equals one. So Alex has the concept of zero, and before Irene did this study with him, it was only thought that us humans had the concept of zero, but this is not true. So once an animal has the ability to imitate, and particularly imitate other species sounds, if we can learn to communicate with them, then that allows us to actually peer into their mind to see what they are thinking in a more easier way than if we use other forms of communication. So I asked, what about the brain? <clears throat> Shown here is a cartoon drawing of a songbird brain, in this case, inside the, uh, the head of the animal. Of course, you can see the beak here. And what has been discovered in vocal learners is that they have regions in their forebrain, I color-coded in red here as well as green, that are responsible for producing and for imitating those learned vocalizations. And they're connected in a pathway, one we call the motor pathway, shown by these arrows here, where different structures like HVC, which stands for high vocal center, to RA, down to the motor neurons in the brainstem right down here, that actually connect to the muscles that control the vocalizations. This pathway is necessary to produce the learned songs. Whereas there's another pathway here that forms a loop from a forebrain area to what we call the basal ganglia striatum area X nucleus to the thalamus, DLM, back up here to the forebrain. This pathway here, this loop, is necessary for imitating the vocalizations. And then finally, the motor pathway feeds into the vocal imitation pathway, which then sends signals back out to the motor pathway to control the actual learning of what is going to be produced. To give you the punchline here, vocal learning species have structures in their forebrain here, uh, this top part of the brain, uh, for this imitation behavior, whereas species that produce only innate vocalizations have these brainstem areas like DM or the motor neurons that actually project to the muscle that control innate vocalizations. And what has happened in the vocal learners is that this forebrain system has taken over this innate system. And so what do I mean by innate vocalizations? All species can produce vocalizations that, well not all, some fish can't actually, and some reptiles can't, but most birds and mammals can. But all those other ones I showed you in the tree produce these innate vocalizations. They don't have this forebrain pathway. So what we have found also is looking at the genes in these uh, brain areas is that when uh, the vocal learning birds, in this case a canary sings, and I'm going to play a song here. That that singing behavior <coughs> is associated with a robust increase of particular genes in the brain uh, shown in the white label here. So what you're seeing here uh, is a brain of an animal who is just passively hopping around and or flying a little bit but not singing, and a brain that of an animal who is singing. The red stain here is uh, what we call crescent violet. It stains all cells in the brain. The white stain here is a 
probe or that recognizes what we call messenger RNA. And this technique that we use is called in situ hybridization. The messenger RNA is a product of a gene uh, that is uh, synthesized in the brain. And what happened here is when the bird sings, the messenger RNA for this gene called Zank is increased in the motor pathway song nucleus HVC and increase in the song learning pathway nucleus called area X here. And what we found is that the more bird sings, um, <coughs> here shown on the x-axis, the more gene expression we see in the song learning nuclei here. And in this case, for every song the bird sang, there was a one-fold increase in the amount of gene expression. The slope of this line here is one. So what does that mean? That means you just heard one song about there was a one-fold increase of a gene expression. If I sing again like like I tried to do to Canary, there's, a, there's more increase. And <clears throat> it's interesting to uh, study this gene in the context of its function, but we've been using it like an imaging approach in the brain, like MRI, to actually uh, assess in the brains of vocal learners where are these structures. So we did the same thing in a hummingbird here. This is a Glaucius hirsuta hummingbird from Brazil. And they would sing, and after singing, then we would look for these gene expression in the brain. I want to show you something about what a hummingbird brain can do. This, uh, the brain is the size of my little tip of the finger here uh, in that head, and this is what it can do. What you're seeing here is a sonogram of a song. Uh, on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the frequency of that sound. And we're going to hear a song play out, and let's see if we can actually follow that song for this 20 second long bit of, uh, of sound. There you go. So, <clears throat> so what you just heard was a uh, hummingbird song that's learned and all these different uh, pieces of information here are what we call syllables. And you can see it morphs from one syllable into the other gradually. But these are complex vocalizations that you cannot get from the brain of a chimpanzee or a horse and many other animals. But yet from this tiny brain, you can produce this complex series of vocalizations um, that he uses to uh, defend territories, attract mates, and communicate. We found that when songbirds or parrots or hummingbirds produce their learned vocalizations, we get areas of the brain that are activated, you just seen this one, in the forebrain, like here in the parrot, uh, uh, with these uh, genes. So this is called uh, MS MST, song nucleus of the basal ganglia. We gave it a different name in the songbird in case they're not related to each other. We called it area X. Likewise, uh, this high vocal center here, and you can see a similar structure down here in the hummingbird, we call the VLN nucleus. When they're listening to uh, songs, you see gene activation in certain, what we call the back of the brain here, the caudal auditory areas, in the parrot and the hummingbird here, as well as in the songbird. But the areas that get activated with vocalizations don't show this uh, gene expression. What we've done with this behavioral molecular mapping tool is to scan throughout the entire brain these areas of uh, activation, these white areas here, and do a semi-3D reconstruction. So what you see here is the brains um, reconstructed with their activation areas and the bird family tree. And what we see is as follows. All species have um, the auditory activation areas. So the auditory pathway, I've color coded in blue here whether you be a songbird, a parrot, or a hummingbird, or even a chicken or a pigeon. And so this auditory pathway is common across all these bird species. Uh, and so we argued that these three vocal learners have inherited this auditory pathway from a common ancestor. It's not something unique. But the vocal learners, they have exactly seven brain areas that I've color coded in red and yellow here that are active in the production of those learned vocalizations. Uh, and 
What's remarkable about them is that those seven of, of those seven, three of them are in similar brain locations, color-coded in red here. These regions here make up that pathway in Songbird that's responsible for uh, imitating the vocalizations, whereas the ones I color-coded in yellow here are responsible for producing those vocalizations. And in songbirds, they're near the auditory pathway in blue here, and in hummingbirds uh, or parrots, uh, they are a little further away. So <clears throat> the question has been, is how did these three species evolve uh, seven brain structures independently from a common ancestor? Or are there really three hypotheses? One is there were multiple gains I've highlighted here in the uh, red dots, uh, where each time vocal learning evolved, nature said, this is the way you're going to do it. You have seven brain structures, uh, not three, not five, and so on. And that's quite remarkable. That says there's a constraint or a limited way in which you can evolve the brain pathways for this trait. Or maybe there was a common ancestor back here somewhere, or even further back in time, and there is at least one, if not roughly seven independent losses of the trait, saying that there was a common ancestor that had the ability to imitate, like Alex did, and all these other species lost these brain pathways, which is also quite remarkable. Or, or maybe everybody has it to various degrees, and what happened in these three groups is that it emerged or it um, advanced independently of a common ancestor. And here I just color-coded the uh, text just to help you along to show you what is a vocal learning pathway, the vocal production learning pathway, and blue, the auditory pathway. So, <clears throat> so with that, uh, those three hypotheses, I began to ask, well, if the bird brain shown here can come up with a solution three independent times in evolution, what makes us humans any different from the birds? Do, are we following a similar solution in terms of a brain circuit for vocal learning? And so to answer that question, I compared bird brains to human brains. Now, these two species, this is a songbird and a human, are separated by 300 million years from a common ancestor, as opposed to 65 million uh, amongst birds. And when we make that comparison, the first thing we learn is can you guess, look at the zebra finch brain here compared to a human brain. What's the big difference here? Brain size does not matter for this complex trait. You can roughly fit 3,000 zebra finch brains into one human brain. Okay. The second lesson we learned here is that, another difference is that the human brain has all this cortical folding, whereas the zebra finch brain is uh, the telencephalon, as we call it, or the cerebrum, is smooth. So cortical folding doesn't matter for this complex trait as well. What I'm arguing is that matters is the presence or absence of this neural network. So let's actually take a slice through uh, the human brain and take a slice through the uh, zebra finch brain and uh, make a comparison. And when early comparative neurologists were doing that in the early 1900s, they came up with a theory that we now don't consider accurate anymore, but I want to explain it because it influences how we compare the, the songbird brain and the human brain. And this theory goes as such. Roughly 100 years ago, a guy named Lewin Edinger had, was comparing the different brain structures of reptiles, birds, and mammals, and you know, including humans, and combined Darwin's recent view of evolution you know, f forming like a tree, and Aristotle's view of scale and natura that says animals have, uh, there are some animals with low behavioral complexity and some with more advanced like humans, and even uh, religion in you know, all this, thinking that evolution was progressive, unlike what Darwin thought. He argued that evolution had a purpose, and that purpose was the generation of humans, or man, as they said. And they thought that you can look back into the structures of the human brain, shown here, at the base of the human brain, and find them in more what they considered primitive animals, like fish. And they argued that there was a structure in the fish brain called paleostriatum that uh, was involved in instinctive behavior that was then passed on to in, uh, amphibians. And amphibians involved a, evolved a structure called the archaeostriatum 
And that was then passed on to reptiles, and reptiles evolved this new structure here in the human brain called the neostriatum. And this is where the idea of the reptilian brain comes from inside us. And it was called neostriatum. And then reptiles passed on that neostriatum to birds, and birds evolved a new structure called the hyperstriatum. Striatum meaning a striated like structure. And the bird brain was thought to be one large colored purple striatal region here involved in instinctive behavior. And only mammals were thought to have this green colored region, which is called cortex. And in humans or um, um, you know, more advanced mammals, they called it neocortex for new cortex. We now know that this view is wrong. Evolution does not occur in a progressive fashion. The purpose of evolution is not to generate humans, and animals show a lot more behavioral complexity than these early biologists gave them credit for. And a lot of the evidence now shows that, like humans, the bird brain has a large cortical region uh, that I color-coded in green here. What's different about it is that the bird brain cortical region is, uh, consists of large clusters of neurons, whereas in mammals it's in layered uh, cortex. Uh, we, birds have this basal ganglia structure in purple and blue here that's similar or homologous to the basal ganglia structures in the human brain, and it's organized similarly, and it, uh, it's also involved in complex behaviors. It's not just for primitive behaviors. So with that aside, um, <clears throat> now I can ask the question, how does the bird brain compare to the human brain for vocal learning structures. And what we see is as follows, is that I ask the question, is there anything in the bird brain, let's say the songbird in particular, that when damaged has certain deficits as to what occurs with the human brain? And the answer is yes. In songbirds, there's these structures here, in, color-coded in red again, that when damaged prevents the bird from imitating song, but they can still sing. It's what we call like an aphasia of song. Well, there are areas in the human brain, in the front part of the cortex, in the basal ganglia here, and in the thalamus, that when damaged, we actually have difficulty producing appropriate speech, like I'm talking now. So if uh, this area here, what's called the dorsolateral cortex, and another region next to it called Broca's area, a very famous area in neurobiology, we go, ah, uh, uh, we have problems sequencing vocalizations together, but we can still speak. Same thing for these birds, and we have problems imitating. In birds, these regions are connected in a loop uh, that's uh, with the thalamus down here. And in non-human primates, motor areas next to where you would expect to find these regions are also connected in a loop in the brain. Likewise, in birds, these areas project to a region of the motor pathway, like the RA nucleus here, that sends out the uh, signals for producing the learned vocalizations. And in non-human primates, such loops for motor behavior are connected to the motor cortex. So we think we got a parallel system here in the human brain, just with a different cortical organization. So now, <clears throat> what I'm showing you here again is the human brain uh, color-coded uh, com in comparison with the zebrafinch brain, and here is that loop that I told you about, and here is this loop here in the songbird brain, and then the output to the motor pathway. I didn't color code in yellow here. I'm now just color coding all the brain regions uh, to be either cortical or basal ganglia or thalamic structures. And what we've learned from a lot of comparative study, a lot more still needs to be uh, uh, looked at, but this is what we know so far, is that amongst birds, they have these four brain areas that produce or imitate the sounds, and in the non-vocal learning species, like a chicken or a pigeon, we don't have any evidence of these four brain structures. Instead, we have these brainstem regions that are involved in the production of innate vocalizations. And in the human brain, likewise, we have all these four brain structures in the cortex, and the basal ganglia, uh, but in a non-vocal learning mammal, the best we can find is a four-brain structure in non-human primates, a macaque, which is basically a monkey, that makes connections but makes an indirect projection to these brainstem neurons that control the voice, but not a direct projection. And when damage in a macaque, this 
they, they can still produce their innate sounds. So it doesn't seem to be used for vocalizations. Another difference here is that in the birds and in humans, our motor cortex region makes a direct input projection to the areas that control the voice, something not found in any of the other species that produce innate sounds. So this direct projection is thought to be necessary for the uh, evolution of song or speech uh, pathways in humans. So in summary, what we have here is a remarkable case of convergence, not only amongst vocal learning birds, but amongst birds with humans for these four brain areas that control what I'm doing now. And <clears throat> the big question has been is how did this come about? Is it independent evolution now not only three times amongst birds, but over 300 million years? Or was there a common ancestor that had these brain pathways and the songbirds and uh, not the songbirds, the relatives of songbirds like chicken or relatives of humans like monkeys lost this ability, which would be quite remarkable. Or maybe everybody has some type of rudimentary pathways. An alternative, I've been told, is also um, could it be some type of designer. But uh, I didn't have any kind of answer to this, um, except more recently in the last two years, I've come up with an answer. And that's what we're going to talk about next.